Kia ora whanau. Shall we make a, a start again? Okay, we're all here. I believe our next submitters are the Business Women's and Professional Women's Council. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And they're appearing by Zoom also. Uh, it's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you very much for making the time. Um, ko Emily Henderson uh, I'm the chairperson for Subcommittee A. I'll just briefly introduce you to uh, the other people in the room. So I'm a Labour MP for Whangare and I'm joining you from Whangare. Uh, we have Dr Liz Craig who is a Labour List MP and I believe she's probably still in Invercargill. Are you Liz? And then we have, uh, actually in Parliament, we have the Green List MP, Jan Nogi, and um, Maureen Pugh, the National uh, List MP. And just briefly, because um, we are ensuring that this hearing is as accessible as we can manage it, we also have our sign language interpreter, Sarah, in the room. Um, and briefly, I will just run through this description. I am a short-haired Pākehā woman wearing a round-necked, dark top and big glasses. Uh, Dr. Craig is another Pākehā woman with um, curly blonde hair, glasses and a dark suit. Uh, Jan Logie is um, also another Pākehā lady with uh, a v-necked, dark top and um, glasses and uh, a blonde silver block bob and then um, although sometimes it is pink you never know with Joanne and then we have um, Maureen who is wearing a bright blue blazer she also has glasses and dark hair but you can take it as read that we have read your submission and we are eager to hear from you if you could keep us a couple of minutes at the end um, because we often have questions thank you thank you Tina Koto Katua and thank you to the select committee members for the opportunity to speak to our submission on the accessibility for New Zealanders bill on behalf of Business and Professional Women New Zealand. I am Christine Berridge, the president of BPW New Zealand, and with me is Diane Glenn, a past president and life member of our organisation. A third member of our organisation was to join us today, but due to family commitments was unable to be present. I'd like to take a moment to mention and thank Siobhan Dilley, our VP Issues, for the work she has done to ensure our submission was completed. Diane in particular informed our submission, having been a long-standing member of the County's Manukau District Health Board she is also a current member of the Southern Health and Disabilities Ethics Committee and has had other roles in this space, as evidenced by her being a recipient of the New Zealand Order of Merit for Services to Disabled Women and the Environment. Thank you, Diane and Siobhan. Today, we're going to highlight some key points in our submission, add some additional comments, and then leave time for questions from you. So why is the Accessibility for New Zealanders Bill important to the women's advocacy group like BPW New Zealand? In our submission, we note how women disabilities are a group that encounter even more discrimination in many aspects of their lives. And this is particularly true for Māori and Pacifica disabled women. Further, by and large, it is women who are the caregivers of family members who are disabled. This could be children, teens, young adults, or partners' husbands who have become disabled through age, illness, or accident, but who all have accessibility needs and experience significant barriers. One of the many being accessibility in terms of pedestrian activity, if you have a wheelchair, a walker, a cane, a scooter, or a stroller. We support the intention of this bill 
which is to accelerate progress towards a fully accessible New Zealand. This is a vitally important vision to work towards. This leads us to question, does this legislation give us an effective framework to achieve that goal? The bill describes the current situation is fragmented, slow, hard to measure, and hasn't led to the credible policy, system design, and service delivery needed to achieve an accessible society. These are some big challenges to overcome, and we are concerned that this bill needs a means of enforcement, standards, a regulator, a disputes resolution pro process with obligations and timeframes. We do not believe that the Accessibility Committee, as outlined in the bill, will have the ability to remove barriers so that every New Zealander has the opportunity to learn, to get a job, feel safe and secure, to provide for or gain access to accommodation of their own choice and take part in the community and social life. BPW New Zealand is affiliated with BPW International, which has general consultative status at the United Nations through the UN Economic and Social Council, it's ECOSOC. In our submission, we talked about compliance with Article 9 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Dis Disabilities. To enable persons with disabilities to live independently and participate fully in all aspects of life. We don't believe this bill is sufficient to achieve that article. We also explained in our submission about our United Nations Association, because we have been hard at work this past year advocating on the disability survey, particularly that it must be conducted every five years so that we are informed about the realities and challenges of people with disabilities. Minister Poto Williams has informed us that budgetary constraints are at play and we believe a more accessible New Zealand will pay itself back in the ability for disabled people to live, work and play alongside all New Zealanders. I would now like to hand over to Diane to speak. Kia ora, I am Diane Glenn, as introduced, a life member of BPW New Zealand. Having family members with a range of disabilities has made me aware of the many barriers experienced by them, so that when I was elected as an Auckland Regional Councillor in 1998, I visited our many regional parks to see what barriers existed to prevent them from enjoying them like the general population could. I saw so many barriers that I arranged a contract with CC Disability Action to audit all the parks and make recommendations, most of which we implemented as we upgraded established parks and developed new ones. <clears throat> Through the regional transport committees, I initiated kneeling buses and level entry to trains from platforms and clips to stabilize wheelchairs once inside. As chair of the RMA hearings panels, I had the ability to ensure accessibility was considered in decision-making for regional development. During the ensuing years, I carried out research through a wide variety of NGOs supporting disabled people to prepare our major reports to the United Nations Monitoring and Reporting Committees, reporting on the many barriers, impediments and discrimination being experienced by disabled people, with a focus on women in the main. Any recommendations that came back to the New Zealand government relied on voluntary undertakings but where were the mandatory ones? As I was later elected to Counties Manukau District Health Board, I re-established the Disability Advisory and Support Committee. And then my family genes caught up with me. And now I experience a physical disability and I'm even more aware of barriers and impediments. Again, there were only improvements we could make on a citywide basis. I became a trained interviewer for Donald Beasley Institute to investigate if disabled people could be suitably accommodated in rental housing and learned of many, many barriers. 
one of my interviewees bought a new townhouse off a plan, but could not get approval for accessible front and back doors or an accessible bathroom until the unit was built, she occupied it, and then had to pay $20,000 to change it. Universal design was nowhere in that plan. I built my own new fully wheelchair-friendly home seven years ago using universal design, but again, only mandatory. Therefore, I was uplifted when I heard of the proposed accessibility for New Zealanders built, but oh so disappointed to read it was no such requirement role and instead all about setting up a committee. Thus, I recommend changing the name to Accessibility for New Zealanders, the Governance Act, and note please our recommendations on page three of our submission. If this bill cannot be amended to include our recommendations, we suggest further work be undertaken to establish a Crown entity such as a Disability Commission, which would enshrine rights, standards, with an enforceable and monitoring system. This could now be managed by FICAHA. And now I'll hand you back to Christine, President. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. To conclude our oral submission, I would like to note we have attended several online fora with regards to the accessibility bill and see that most important statement anyone submitting on this bill can make is that it, it is that the bill needs to be about the need to provide direction for accessibility measures in the public sector and having an enforceable pathway for the removal of barriers. I reiterate the recommendation that three quarters of the members of the committee should be disabled. It is important that it is shown that, as in most other committees that have a purpose of supporting a specific group of the community, that most of the representation have accessibility issues. Support allowing those with needs in question to have a voice. It is also important that the impact the committee has is strengthened by knowing that their recommendations to the Ministry for Disabled Persons, Waikaha, are given greater powers, including but not limited to that which allows for independent investigation, setting standards, investigating, and resolving complaints about systematic non-compliance. In summary, we urge you to be brave, bold, and transformational to create a difference. Give this framework teeth. We thank you so much for listening to us, and we welcome any questions from the committee. Thank you very much. Um, now I'm just looking around the room. Have we got any questions? Yes, we have Maureen and Jan. Um, thanks very much, ladies, for your submission. I have to say I'm particularly impressed with the way you've broken down your recommendations on the parts and clauses in the bill. That's extremely helpful. Um, uh, so, Diane, um, I, just, I just wanted to um, re reassure you that this committee stage is about doing our best to improve the bill. Uh, so we've heard from many submitters about the need for some kind of authority or um, ability to instruct uh, for action. Uh, so, you know, from my perspective, that will be part of the recommendations that we would be putting forward. Um, but uh, apart from that, I think you've covered everything off really nicely in your submission. Thank you very much. Jan. Thank you. Um, and I just want to start by acknowledging um, your work on housing and those collection of um, stories, Diane. I, I, it totally fueled my outrage and um, sense of responsibility as a MP. Um, so thank you for that. Um, in terms of, I'm just wondering, and you may not want to answer this now, and if you wanted to give us a response after, that's completely fine. But whether you've seen the um, Human Rights Commission's submission, um, where they have us, I think a specific proposal really that the, um, the minister, um, B, 
be responsible, given the job of being responsible for setting access standards in secondary legislation, and that there be an additional regulatory body established for enforcing, and that in effect the, um, there be a co-design process in the development of those standards. So um, I guess it's that seems as if it's a proposal to address um, the UN's concern about their needing to be co-design and to get those points around standards and enforcement. But we've also been hearing from other people that it kind of that they're wanting feel as if we need to go back to the starting point and start the co-design for the whole process. So whether you've got a view on that proposal. Um, I don't believe we can we need to go right back to the beginning. I know when we were on the forum discussing it with some 100 different representatives of disability organizations, mm -hmm. um, there were many recommendations to just scrap the whole thing and yeah. start again. And we thought about this as an organization and felt it took us too far away from actually making New Zealand accessible. And we felt that if we, could, if we could use this bill as a starting point, and yes, you've established a committee, but I don't believe the name, I, I think the name is misleading, just saying accessibility for New Zealanders, because you're not really providing an enforceable accessibility. You're setting up a committee to actually do the work. Um, so this could be the starting point, but if you could give this, um submit this bill the teeth that we're talking about we could be a long way ahead rather than right back to the beginning there's there's no way we want to go right back because that takes us back about five years but now i believe we move forward yes we accept this bill but it is really about establishing committee but give that committee teeth can we ask you that Thank you very much. And um, yeah, really good uh, comment there. And may I just say um, a lot of uh, aroha to the Donald Beasley Institute um, that I worked with on the accessibility guidelines for the courts. Um, and I think the work that you guys have done over the years is just outstanding. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. We will now move to our last submitter, um, who is uh, Julianne. Um, Kavala, who is also joining us uh, by Zoom, I believe. I'm sorry, Juliana. Juliana. How are we going there, Izzy? We're just bringing through Juliana now. Um, here she comes. Juliana, welcome to the uh, Social Services Select Committee Subcommittee A for Emily Henderson Aho. I'm the chair today. Uh, you have also listening to you, uh, the interpreter Kelly. We have some staff in the room and we have Dr. Liz Craig, who's a Labour MP on Zoom. And we have Jan Logie, a Green MP and Maureen Pugh, a National MP in the room also. And um, I'm also a Labour MP. Would it be helpful to have a brief description of each of us? You're on mute. You're on mute, Juliana. Can you hear the committee? You can't hear. Okay. Um, the first thing I do when I have that problem is to look at the volume on my, on my computer. If you come off mute, we sh can you come off mute and let's see whether we can hear you. Yeah, all right. Um, Izzy, could you um, 
see if you can help Juliana sort that out and we'll just wait because there's not much point in my trying to talk her through when she can't actually hear us through the screen. Yes, Madam Chair. Another submission had that problem before. Mm. I just, I turned up yes, before. and it was it was the volume button on on the other submitter's um, computer. They needed to turn up. Okay, for those following along and wondering what's happening, we're having difficulty with our submitter's microphone, so she's just disconnected and is going to connect again and see if we can get it right this time. So just hang on with us. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, oh, finally. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Well Bloody done. Monday, right? <laughs> thank you. Thank you for sticking with us and trying again. No, thank you for being patient. No, I don't no. know what happened, but I, it's all unplugging, plugging. Okay. Technology. Great technology. Internet. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, can I just start by welcoming you and uh, introducing myself, um, Ko Emily Henson Aho. I'm the acting chair today, and um, well, I am the chair today. Uh, in the room with us, we have interpreter Kelly, um, and we have uh, Jan Logie, Green MP. We have Maureen Pugh, National MP. We have Liz Craig, Labour MP, and me, also a Labour MP. Um, would you like a brief description of each of us? No, that's okay. Okay. Well, you can take it as read that we have read your submission and uh, you can speak to it uh, if you can in any way you want. If you wouldn't mind uh, just checking in a couple of minutes toward the end so that we can see whether there's anyone who would like to ask you a question that can be very yeah. helpful for us. Otherwise, this is your time. We're here to hear from you. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I think I will go straight to my own experience as um, someone that has lived lived with disability half of my life. Um, so I live half of my life without an impairment. And what was really staggering was that the day one that I sit in a wheelchair, many rights that I took for granted just disappeared just because you know I could not, no longer use my legs. I became a second class citizen. And that was back in Brazil. Um, you have to become disability advocate because anything that you will do in your life, you need to always be self-advocating. And I have to become a disability advocate, not because I wanted to, you know, I would rather spend my time doing other stuff, but you have to be always be advocating for yourself and for others. Then after moving to New Zealand, I uh, was really shocking for me to find out that there was no accessibility legislation here when in Brazil since the year 2000 we have a really well established accessibility legislation so whenever I have a situation where I face it you know um, discrimination because you guys need to understand that lack of, lack of accessibility equals discrimination you know might not be a direct discrimination, might be indirect discrimination, but it is lack of accessibility is discrimination. And I remember my first experience here was when I saw a brand new branch of the ANZ Bank, brand new Queen Street, and it was not accessible. And I remember that I went there, called the media, and a week later, some 10 year old kids say that they found a solution and there was like a, um, a lift, very simple lift. So you see, we need to have a way to enforce accessibility. So the 24% of the population that identify as having a disability can have equal access and fully participate so that was my first experience. Then my other experience was I was uh, using the ferry to go to work and I received a call from Auckland Transport saying that I should use a different way of transport because the ferry was not accessible and I was putting others at risk because they need to help me to get into the ferry. Can you imagine that you're being asked to use a different public transport service? public you know that's the, and it's every day and it's everywhere um then the, the cherry on top of the cake i would say is that when i moved from auckland to tauranga i couldn't find any place that was accessible because i'm a wheelchair user so the main challenge is always the bathroom and i spent six months showering in the porch until I could find a solution. Can you imagine that? You have to shower in the porch because there's no accessible houses. There is no place where you can go that it will suit you. The crazy thing is that um, the solution found was to put a portable kind of shower that cost $30,000 of public money and it shouldn't, you know. So retrofitting and trying to amend things after, it's way more expensive. 
and we will be doing a favor to not only all people with disabilities, but for everybody that, you know, might grow older and have some access needs, or might break a leg and need crutches for some time, or for mummies with the babies, or for, you know, for everybody. If we, if we use universal design, now is Christmas time, how many people, how many families cannot have some of their loved ones in their own places to come together because their houses are not accessible, you know? And it's every day and it's everywhere. Um, I think I was listening to the other oral submissions and everybody's on the same page about the frustration with this bill. And I ask myself, you know, as someone that has been advocating for the creation of legislation since the gecko, since I moved to New Zealand, what else, what else we need to do to be heard? What else we need to do with a petition? We do campaigns, we talk to the media, we what else we need to do? Tell me. I, I actually instead of um, I want to make questions. Where 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 what is so difficult? to implement a policy that will benefit the whole entire country. You know, I wanna answer. So please, any of you can address, where is the roadblocks? What else do you want from the disability community to be heard? We've been saying it for over and over and over, you know, that there's no, no accessible housing, that kids don't have access to inclusive education that every day that someone that uses a wheelchair, you have to do always a massive plan, check out all these places, you know, and it's always the burden is on the person. Now it's summertime. Summertime is a, is a time of extremely frustration for me because I can't go to the beach, you know, because you go there, there is no mat, there is no, and then what do you do? You just watch others enjoying and then I want to take my, my, my niece to the playground. She's seven year old and she actually did her submission as well. I can push her in the swing because there's a bloody barrier that prevents me from getting into the playground. And the thing is, having a disability is not something bad. You know, it's part of our human diversity. And for many years, segregation has been preventing the rest of our society from, from learning, from, you know, from understanding, from getting the benefits of living in a, in a diverse society. The other thing that is really shocking, and I think this should be in the legislation as well, and that's one of the calls for the access matters, is the accessibility legislation to, bring, to be a lens through which you can filter and prevent other legislations to keep discriminating. So Jen Log, you might know, took me seven years fighting for to stay in this country. I am in immensive legal battle with Immigration New Zealand because of systemic discrimination, systemic barriers in the immigration system that want to single out people with disabilities from this country. You know, we need to look ourselves in the mirror and see, okay, am, am I doing really all that I can do as a member of the parliament to address um, this massive issue that is relevant to 24% of the population directly, but indirectly, you have, you know, that affects me my everyday, but I have my mom, I have my sister, I have my niece, and our interactions are also affected because of a lack of accessibility. So, yeah, I, I just want to answer is what else, what else do you want from the disability community? Do we need to do like the Americans did and occupy the parliament and do, you know, what else is needed to be heard? That's my question for all of you. Okay, well, thank you, um, Juliana, for uh, another submission in which, you know, you brought lived experience into the room and you've made it that much plainer to all of us. Um, just what it is like to be living with disability in this community and and what the need is. I'm just looking around the room and yep, we have Jan wanting to ask a question. Jan. Um, thanks, Joanna. Um, the, I, I, there's two things actually, if I could. The, um, 
It's very clear, and I can't answer the question you've put to us. I'm hoping through the process of um, this committee, <laughs> we'll have some good discussions and, and maybe nothing else will be required. Maybe we'll get there. Um, the, if you've seen the Human Rights Commission submission, um, where they're proposing that the minister um, is has the responsibility for um, accessibility standards in secondary legislation, and there be an additional regulatory body for enforcing them. I, I guess my core question is, do you think we can fix this legislation with idea and, and do you support that idea? Or do you think it needs to start again? And what would that mean? I think we don't have time to start again. You know, we need to get this right now and not and stop with, with the talking and if if I, I don't know i don't understand completely like the legis, le, legislative process and what is out of scope you know and how how much change we can make into the current bill but the bill as it is honestly you just it's rubbish it's a joke it's a bad taste joke and what the Human Rights Commission is suggesting, yeah, that would be great if we can have that. And if we can just shove in that information and make that into the bill, perfect. Because we don't need to reinvent the wheel as well. You know, we're not, we're not going, we're not vanguard here, you know, creating something new. No, just look around other countries, even a country like Brazil, you know, that you can learn from. Cool. Thank you. And we need we need action fast, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. because every time the, the the more we delay with 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 getting action and actually creating those standards and making them enforceable, every day public money is going to create new barriers every day, and that will cost ten thousand more ten times more to undo those barriers, you know. Like it's just what what people don't get it is that. I imagine that the main concern is like, oh my God, costs, costs. Think outside of the box, you know, if we have this accessibility revolution, that's what I see. Imagine there will be the accessibility industry the same way that is already in Brazil. You have like um, recruitment agencies specialized in recruiting people with disabilities because we have a quota system. You know, you have uh, businesses that just operate like finding new solutions to make what seems impossible to be accessible possible because we have a lot of, a lot okay. of historical buildings, for example, and you, you, you find the most amazing solutions, you know, to make it accessible. If we, you will have, if we yeah. outside the box. Listen, and, and if we learn from others' experiences, um, listen, thank you very much. We are actually at time. I have noticed yeah. Maureen did have her hand up. Maureen, are you? Uh, very quick one, if I can, Madam Chair. Yes, um, Juliana, you mentioned the example that you've got experience with in Brazil. Are you aware of other countries that do it well that we could look to? Yeah, you can look at America. You can look at Switzerland. You can look at Canada. Um, you can look even in Australia, you know, mm -hmm. if you don't want to look that far. Um, you can look at, yeah, I would say look at America, look at Brazil, look at Switzerland, mm, okay. Norway. Right. The, um, the EU we have, EU, yeah. Australia and America we, and Canada we have on our radar, but I don't believe we've had Brazil on our radar. No. So that's a really interesting um, one. Thank you very much. We weren't aware yeah. The progress so I work, I work for seven years in the eight years in the parliament of my state back in Brazil. The parliament was accessible. We had MPs that were disabled. And yeah. even when you go to, I don't know how to call it, uh, but where you go to stand and speak and do your speech, that was accessible. There were lifts to that. Everything was accessible. There was like, I don't know, historical buildings, as, just, as I said, you know, that you should preserve. Mm -hmm. They were yeah. accessible. Well, it's really interesting. Um, as someone who was recently on crutches, uh, double crutches for some time, I'm, I'm vividly aware how inaccessible our parliament is. Yeah, you had a taste. Yeah. Yeah, I did. And it was a very minor taste. So, yes. Listen, thank you very much. Much appreciated. And um, we'll now go into private session to 
to apply okay. visuals. But thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your time. And I really hope you guys listen and do something. Put yourself in our shoes. We're listening. Thank you. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. All right. Well, um, committee, we're going to now go into private uh, to speak to our officials. So thank you um, to Sarah and to Kelly for all the work you've done this morning helping us. And thank you to all our submitters for their time.